will be thank you, Matthew. We will be recording this meeting. So welcome to the Under the Hood Tech in the Time of Crisis session. Thanks for joining us today. I will give you an overview of what we're here to talk about, introduce the other panelists who are here, um, and then open it up for Q&A. So while we, before we start, think of some of the questions you might be asking. If you don't want to lose track of them, go ahead and pop them in chat. We won't answer them right away, but we'll make sure we queue them up. And then after the round of intros, I'll um, ask folks to raise their hand and we'll make this more of a discussion rather than just us talking at you. Um, what else? Oh, and, and so I'll, I'll go ahead and give you all a little bit of a background and then we'll go into um, intros from, from everyone. So a big part of this um, is that it's a, been a really, really big movement starting well beyond, well before healthcare.gov, but many of us, uh, some of us here have been involved in healthcare.gov. So we'll kind of start there and talk about how that led to USDS. And then now when we have the US digital response with COVID, um, this is part of like this broader movement as well. And many of these people here are the ones that have done the work behind the scenes, on the ground, oftentimes never even asking for credit, just some of the biggest, my own heroes and biggest um, public servants in this country um, and and how important it is for us to queue up so much talent and resources and ideas so that when something like this happened we were able um, or they were able to pull together this crisis response team um, in the country and I and some of them can talk about how quickly they were able to mobilize people but I think the number was like 1200 people volunteered after the first week or or so um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with healthcare.gov, that was back in 2013, where a big technology failure in this country um, created risk for derailing one of a sitting president's largest policy initiative. And a whole, there's a team that came out through a slew of people, um, people who knew it called in their friends, there were public servants who were already um, in government who came out all hands on deck to stabilize that website. That later on led to, in addition to a lot of other work that had been done in government to think about ways to bring tech people into government, led to the found, foundation for what later became the United States Digital Service and 18F and the Presidential Innovation Fellows. Um, and th those still all exist. And most recently, the, the US Digital Response Team um, that spun up very recently with Corey, Ryan, um, Jen Palka, and many others who they have brought along with them. Um, and it's been really just an incredible movement for me personally to watch. And so when, um, when Dan Levy asked a bunch of our faculty members to host a session, this is one of the first things I thought of. And I talked to Corey, who um, is, is at the Beck Center at Georgetown. And, and so we decided to co-host co a session together with um, the Kennedy School and the Georgetown Beck Center for Social Impact Innovation. And then Corey, hopefully you can talk a little bit about that as well when I turn it over, over to you. Um, and before we get started, I wanted to make sure I, oh, note to self, turn off notifications. Before we get started, I wanted to do a really quick intro for the folks you see on the screen right now, and then I'll turn it over to them to tell their own stories. And while they tell their own stories, please make sure you think of all the questions you might have for them because I'm sure there'll be plenty. So you have, we have with us Corey, I'm one of the co-founders of the US Digital Response. She's also currently the director of the Digital Service Collaborative at Georgetown Beck Center for Social Innovation, or Impact and Innovation, and was previously a US Deputy CTO. Uh, we have Raylene, who is the CEO of the US Digital Response, um, was a fellow at the Aspen Tech the Aspen, the Aspen Institute's um, Tech Policy Hub, um, and was most recently uh, an engineering and product executive at both Stripe and Facebook. Jennifer Anastasoff, the head of people at the United States Digital Service, where she was a founding member and grew USDS from five to 200 in about two years. Jennifer, definitely check that if that is incorrect. Um, and is also a Kennedy School alum and founded Fuse Corps, among a number of other, other things. Um, and Mina, founder and executive director of the Digital Service at Health and Human Services here in the United States. 
uh, leading on a couple different COVID projects, helping also with the U.S. digital response, was on the healthcare.gov rescue team um, before that, the vice president over at Optin and VC work, and also worked on robotic arms and prosthetics, which is just, um, I find so amazing. Um, and then we have um, Ryan Panchatram, who is also the co-founder of U.S. digital response, is currently also at Kleiner Perkins um, in doing VC work and was also a, a Deputy Chief Technology Officer of the U.S. as well. And a fun fact, for those of you who are on a Mac, was responsible for the user experience and design of um, Outlook for Mac in 2011. So with that, they are going to now tell us a little bit more about themselves. And I've asked them each to uh, say a couple of things, their physical location, their involvement with crisis response related things in their lifetime, not just for this, an aspect of their background that led them to do this work. And then uh, the simplest thing that they brought to a crisis response that they thought that but for them made the biggest difference. And I think that's really interesting to think about because there's so much many of you on this call as well can bring to some of these scenarios that can make such a huge difference in the environment that we're in and it doesn't have to be the big it build a whole new big flashy infrastructure thing it might be something really simple that can turn around a, uh, a dire situation so with that i will turn it over to uh, corey and i'm going to turn off this slide so that corey is on your screen when you talk go ahead corey Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy, and to the Harvard Kennedy School team for partnering with us at Georgetown for this event. We are, um, it's great to have the, the gang together to tell some stories today about what we've learned um, and what we're continuing to learn along the way. So I'm Corey Zarek. I am um, based in San Francisco, um, although I work with Georgetown, so I have um, quite a long commute in ordinary times. Um, my uh, crisis response involvement at the moment is with the U.S. Digital Response. As you heard, along with some of our colleagues joining us today, uh, I helped to co-found that effort a few weeks ago, and we can talk with you more about it. But the short version is um, we recognize that governments are on a good day under an, an extraordinary amount of strain to provide services and especially to use data and technology to provide those services. And so in a moment of crisis, it's even more important to shore up those data and tech uh, offerings. And so with US Digital Response, we're, uh, we've identified um, now 3,500 um, technologists from across the United States who've raised their hands to say that they uh, would like to volunteer their time and energy and skills in their local communities or working with sta uh, state and local governments or governments anywhere across the country um, to ensure that our systems keep running, that neighbors can continue to find the information they need on government websites, that um, people can apply for small business loans or food stamps or any other services they need from governments and that things just keep working as they should. Um, aspects of my background that led me into this particular crisis, um, I, I, a couple of things I have uh, found to be true in my work over the years. One is that um, interconnected networks of people working together can get so much more done than if we were to work on problems and try to solve them individually. And so taking a very networked approach to, to work um, is, is really how I have approached everything in my career. And I think that uh, having had strong networks and foundations in place uh, through some of the colleagues who are here today and many, many more um, people who bring different skills to the table, whether it's a, a tech skill or a policy skill or something else, um, having those broad networks um, of people uh, working together can help get us to the, the um, better outcomes that we're striving for. And, and that's what really um, I've been bringing to this particular crisis. The simplest thing I've brought to this crisis, um, I started my career as a newspaper reporter. And especially when you're in the midst of a crisis with technologists, you need good writers. Um, you need people who can explain um, hard concepts very succinctly and write uh, very quickly on the fly. Um, those are good skills we should all have. And having had that in my um, back pocket over the years has been quite useful um, when we're in, in need of telling a story on the fly. Awesome, thank um, you so much, Corey. Um, you need good writers, everyone. That skill becomes super handy. Raylene, would you like to go next? 
Sure. Um, so I'm also in San Francisco and fun fact, Corey and I learned after maybe a week of like daily Zoom calls that we live probably like a few blocks from each other, really. Um, we, I don't know when we'll get to meet, hopefully someday soon. Um, similar involvement in crisis response for me is, is definitely USDR. Um, as you mentioned, my entire career before this has been in the private sector. I basically spent 10 years at Facebook and Stripe. Um, so working in government is, is completely new, unlike everyone else on this call. Um, so I've been great company. Uh, what led me here though is, um, you know, a longstanding interest in um, civic engagement and, and working with the government. Um, I did a fellowship with the Aspen Institute right after I left Stripe, and that was like a crash course in how does the government work? What is policy? Um, one thing I'm really grateful for as well on the team is there are such great writers like Corey and, and many others, because I think something I've learned is just how important communication and clarity of communication and thought and process, um, especially when it comes to working with the government, just how important that really is. Um, let's see. What is a simple tip to help? Okay, so I'm gonna put on my classic and, and the people on the USDR will laugh at this, my classic like scaling hat. Um, so I'm a little bit obsessive about just keeping track of information and like really streamlining work. And I think one thing that's helped um, me and I think helped USDR work, work better is, you know, every day we really push super hard on how do we make the processes that we were doing yesterday more efficient today. And this could be everything from like, everyone has to put, you know, all of your information in the same, like spreadsheet of the same intake form. And one concrete example is the volunteers. I think, you know, if we had kind of a more looser structure, like anyone could apply to be a volunteer anytime and we could place them randomly, I think we'd have a lot more work on our hands, but instead we've really pushed everything into like a single kind of linear recruiting pipeline where people apply online. We have a team that like vets and looks at people um, every day. And then we carefully like place them into government um, relationships and I think that's really helped us keep the quality bar high and also helped us to move really quickly. Thanks. Thanks so much, Raylene. And thanks for coming to us from um, the private sector. Uh, Jennifer, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, hey, I'm Jennifer Anastasoff. I'm clearly coming to you from San Francisco uh, as well. Um, I, uh, uh, it, Kathy probably uh, should feel bad about asking about our history in emergency response. When I was 14, I helped with the emergency response in 1989 for the earthquake in San Francisco. I've been in pretty much every earthquake in California uh, in, at the epicenter. So wherever I am, there may be an earthquake. Um, so I had actually uh, been involved in very direct emergency response in a past life. Um, but, uh, but in uh, this case, uh, I have been lucky enough to support and to help uh, my colleagues, Corey Raylene and, and uh, Ryan, uh, in the U.S. digital response uh, based on largely, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go to uh, the, the, the parts of life that led up to this, and it actually gets into the simplest way that I can help. Um, very directly, it's been through relationships. So, I think the biggest thing that I have brought to this uh, effort, um, both directly with uh, the team that's on this call and also in the state of California uh, and their response um, uh, broadly is uh, over time, I don't, you know, unless it's necessary, I don't burn bridges uh, and I invest a lot in relationships with humans. Um, and so I share that both because I think it's important to realize that when it comes to an emergency, and I think Corey really hit at this with the concept of networks, but when it comes to an emergency, that's the worst time to start getting to know someone, right? The best time to start getting to know someone, uh, even though there are amazing people who I've met through the, the digital response effort, the best time to get to know someone is when you're working on stuff together uh, prior to that emergency. Um, and uh, the second best time might be when you just have to do stuff together, but, um, but being able to draw on and understand people, uh, draw on relationships in ways that are going to be helpful uh, to a cause is, um, is I think the simplest, simplest way. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I had no idea you were involved in past earthquake responses either. Uh, thanks yeah. for sharing that. Mina, would you like to go next? Yes, hello everyone. Um, my name is Mina Shung. I am based in Boston, actually in Somerville, because a lot of you are in Cambridge. Um, and uh, sorry, my prompt went off my phone. 
Um, so let's see, my physical location is here, my crisis response involvement. So um, I um, worked on a lot of ad hoc crisis response in my life. The earliest one that was sort of government focused, I think was healthcare.gov, where I got to work with some great folks here, including Ryan. Ryan and I spent uh, like 700 hours in a row immediately in the same room next to each other. Um, so we both worked on the healthcare.gov rescue, as was mentioned before, which sort of led me into a large number of um, government crisis response scenarios. Um, I then came back to Massachusetts and helped um, lead a lot of work on fixing the Massachusetts healthcare exchange. And then when I went, as Kathy mentioned, to um, the US Digital Service, um, I ended up probably um, helping to lead about 15 different crisis responses, some of which are easy to talk about and some of which are harder to talk about, but it kind of became a piece of the bread and butter of what we ended up working on. Um, and it was a great opportunity to be able to bring teams of technical folks, um, but with a lot of non-technical expertise in to help agencies in scenarios um, where they needed an outside pair of eyes to come and look in and also just say no and provide a bunch of perspectives. So I guess in that vein, and I'm happy to answer lots of questions about more of those, um, I think two of the simplest things to bring, I know that's not what you asked, um, but capitalizing on what folks here said, one, there's um, just, I can't emphasize enough, I agree with exactly the synthesis of what Raylene and Corey said, which is documenting very clearly things and then making it repeatable, right? So Ryan and I put together a series of one page documents and if you can make, which were actually two and a half pages, but if you can make a really concise synthesis that you can hand to literally everybody and they will all develop the same understanding, that repeatability and that clarity of communication is like exactly what is necessary in a crisis. Um, and then the one other thing I would say is um, sometimes if you are an outside entity and you do not really know what this, you have an ability to say no and say true things that people who have been embroiled in uh, a bureaucracy do not always have the opportunity to say. Um, and we can expand on that later, but those, if you can figure out diplomatically how to do that, that opportunity also can be transformative. Um, and I also have um, a crisis responder who is making a lot of this is, this is story today is her four month birthday. So she'll be joining us on this panel. Uh, Happy birthday, Jordan. Ryan, would you like to go next? Of course. Um, name is Ryan Pinchatser. Uh, physical location is, of course, in San Francisco, like many folks here in the Dog Patch neighborhood. Um, my level of crisis involvement, you know, I love the question because you're asking about even prior to all these experiences. I would actually call the time with the, the Outlook for Mac team our own kind of a little crisis, right? You know, you can put a name on a product, Outlook 2011, you've got a date you need to ship it by. And so, for us and that team, it was this incredible scramble to rebuild from scratch on the Mac environment and a, a, a piece of email software that people um, were really used to using on the PC and we had to figure out ways how to bring that to the Mac. But that uh, was early on, but really on the crisis side, being part of the healthcare.gov rescue team with Nina and a handful of folks uh, and taking that from a, a website that could barely stay up and, and uh, uh, was, you know, I think the, the response rate was like, um, uptime was like 48%, which basically means you're down for most of the day, no one being able to get through, being able to usher through multiple enrollment windows and getting to the end of uh, March, April with 7 million people enrolled was just a, a world of experiences that I know Mina and I would love to share with, with you here. And so if you have questions particularly on that, we'd love to answer them. PostHealthcare.gov is working with the CTO's office on how to engage well with agencies and how to use tech well and all of those had their little mini crises and then we're basically at to the moment where we are now um, with uh, the USDR with Corey, Raylene and others and helping find volunteers to assist state and local governments. Uh, the question of my background, I was an engineer turned product manager and at the time of healthcare.gov, you know, proximity was one of the reasons why I got pulled into that crisis and being able to raise my hand in that moment and think, hey, does anyone need any help? And that, that really put me on that team. And so for healthcare.gov, I found myself at the center of it. But for this crisis here with the coronavirus, you know, we're on the edges and as an edge as a volunteer, finding ways to help 
are very different. And so we can dig more into that. And to wrap with the simplest thing, uh, in any crisis, I think it's being continually curious, right? I think that's something that Mina and I were always uh, found ourselves doing, being curious about what the next problem could be and being able to prioritize what those next problems could be and then making the, our work uh, truly actionable. And so I think the simplest thing that anyone here can do in a crisis is being more curious than the next because in any crisis, there's just another domino that may fall. And so. Thank you so Back much. You, Thank you. Um, I, I love hearing all those last pieces so much. And I want to really point out how with among the six of us, there are at least four engineers who are engineers by training and none of those simple things were engineering answers, right? There were all process and people focus. So on one hand, it's the digital response and it's a lot of bring your tech talent to come do this. But at the core of it, it's the writing, it's the documentation, those relationships that you can't build overnight, like Jennifer said, that are so incredibly critical to movements um, like this. And there are so many others. Um, I mean, I, I think on this panel alone, we have a cross cut of law and writing and engineering and policies. And there are so many others who over time, like Gary Meyer and Vivian Globard and Jen Polka, who really set the foundation because they had the knowledge of how government and systems worked so that when many people came, they were able to do the work and hit the ground running mm -hmm. in many, many ways. Um, so as people queue up your, queue up your questions, um, there is a hand raise option if you go to the participants list and you can raise your hand um, and I'll call on you. And while some of you figure that out and do that, I'm going to go ahead and queue up a question now for, for them to answer. Oh, I also realized really quickly, I had to introduce myself. I teach a class on product management here at the Kennedy School. And because of a lot of the other work that many people did in the US government, I was able to come join USDS um, around the same time as Jennifer to work on some of the projects both Jennifer and, um, and Mina talked about as well. Um, can someone, if, is there, if there's an issue with, uh, Matt, do you know if we have hand raising off or chat or anything like that? I just haven't seen a whole lot come through. Uh, no, it should be on. Okay, awesome, thanks. So raise your hand. Um, if we were in my class, I would stare at some of you because um, I know I know you have questions around this topic. But for, for the folks who, the first question, some folks have no idea what's going on um, with the COVID response with um, US, USDR. Can one of you share just some high level activities, um, what the volunteers look like, what people are working on, what kind of involvement, Ryan, you mentioned that this, you know, we're kind of on the peripheral, you're all kind of on the peripheral, what does that look like on the grounds? Um, can you share more of just what USDR is doing? Raylene. Sure, yeah, I was like, there's three of us, or four of us. Um, uh, yeah, I can definitely talk a little bit about um, maybe some at a high level, kind of the type of work we do, and I can share some highlights on projects. The short version is, um, I think Corey, we're on another call earlier, she put this well. I think what we've, in some ways, what we've been developing is almost like this framework of like, we hear from governments what they need. We have a team that tries to internalize what that is, and then we identify the best solutions. So um, for the general, then the specific, the general is our help looks either like, sometimes we put people on teams. So we've had engineers like work with the city or work with the state of New Jersey innovation team to just like develop products side by side. Uh, we've had data scientists go to like the state and just sit with the health and human services team to like look at their actual live corona case numbers and like try to do projections. So those are just examples where we've embedded people. We also have ones where it's we found a tool that exists in the wild and we almost serve to help as like getting feedback or more people to use that tool. So covidactnow.org is a tool that at this point I think probably most states have already seen and looked at and that's one that was completely separately built and we sort of heard about it and have worked with them closely to kind of get them in front of, of other people. Um, and then the last area is, is sometimes we build specific things that didn't exist well. So a good example of that project is um, neighborexpress.org. Um, it's, it's it was actually like kind of a, a fun, interesting story is, um, so we heard from one city in California and, and they were like, we need to find volunteers who can help um, deliver food to senior citizens who are you know, stuck at home during this time. 
So our team built kind of a scrappy, like, you know, basic website, basic like back end uh, with an air table and shipped it to Concord. And we're like, here you go. Like, here's, here's a way you can collect volunteers and do matching. Uh, we then found that basically every city seems to need this. Um, and we didn't want to be in the business of like owning all these databases and websites for all these different cities. So we basically open source the entire stack and are using off the shelf tools. So now what we do is we actually talk to a city and like very, very quickly within hours, days, we'll set up their own version of Neighbor Express that they get to own and they kind of have the data and they, they do all the matching. So that's another example. Um, I would say just to like hit on some of the, I don't want to, it's, I don't know how to say this, but they're kind of like the hot topics and that they're just super important and real problems. We're also working on um, what is around scaling out benefits um, to kind of everyone all over the country. I think there's a lot of money coming from the CARES and just the stimulus um, uh, dollars coming into states and it really needs to get to people who need the help. Um, and right now there's a lot of layers in between the money and the people from everything from like unemployment uh, benefit websites that are crashing to like very complex flows that you don't even know if you're eligible or not. And then of course the government employees themselves who are just overworked and now dealing with orders of magnitude more applications. Um, so we have a, a kind of big project just trying to figure out how we can help on that. And then another one, um, one of them, I think one of the more just very hairy, difficult problems in, in all of this is how to think about um, recovery and contact tracing and testing and tracing and just whatever the code words are, but the name of like, how do you kind of assess what the spread is like so that you can model it and you can potentially make changes to the you know, shelter in place and let's start let, letting people go back to work. Um, and on that one, similarly, very hairy topic, many, many players in the field. And what we're doing is trying to be more of a, um, a resource where we, when we come across a solution, we'll vet it, we'll look at it. We have some really amazing engineers like looking at the actual apps and the code and trying to see how they work. But we're also trying to take a step back and provide almost more like guidance and philosophy around how do you think about privacy, th how do you think about data, and how do we work with kind of platforms um, and, and more like groups that will advise all of the apps out there versus like making individual contact tracing apps. Um, so it's a long spiel, but hopefully that gives you a flavor of what we're doing. Super helpful. Thanks, Berlin. Do you, does anyone else want to add one more comment and we'll move on to Beatrice's question about local local governments. I'm going to add one quick comment, which is that um, I think you've heard from a few of us, we've been uh, overwhelmed with the generosity of spirit that Americans have in raising their hands to say they want to use their skills to help with us and with other efforts. And where we are, especially with US Digital Response right now, is looking for those um, government and other um, problems that we can put these volunteers on to solve. So uh, where folks can be most helpful to us right now is identifying systems that might not be working as well as they could or websites that could use um, some support and um, additional um, skills and talent that perhaps our pool of volunteers could bring. And, and if you can, um, connecting us with government leaders who can actually um, work with us and our volunteers to get some of these projects in motion. We've got a, we've got a great pool of, of folks who want to get to work and we'd like to put them to work. Awesome. Thank you, Corey. I'm going to shift a little bit. Beatrice, you had a great question and instead of reading it out, I think it'll be great for you to introduce yourself um, and tell us where you are physically and, and then ask your question if you're up for that. Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I am currently in Cambridge, but I'm from Brazil. And I was wondering the following. Um, I'm thinking about the developing world and the fact that many central governments don't have the capacity or they don't prioritize the, a clear digital strategy. So uh, what are your views on what local governments should do? Should they uh, build their own systems to respond to the crisis, maybe, uh, even if uh, these are fragile solutions, or should they wait for um, a central response from the, uh, the federal level or the state level? Uh, Go ahead, Mina. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it a tiny bit. Um, and thank you. It's a really great question. I mean, even in countries like here, it can vary the extent to which the central government is going to take on issues versus the local government. Um, you know, what has ended up happening here, and I actually um, also spent a fair amount of time building digital solutions in developing countries, I think what ends up effect working effectively, especially for a quick response, a thing like um, an emergency response, one thing that's important to note 
is that there are lots of times that you assume that there is somebody else in charge who is doing something. And these are the moments where there isn't enough time to let that play out and assume that that is true. It is often better to start doing the right thing if the right thing is clear. And at the moment when a lot of people are doing a very similar correct thing, then building that network and consolidating can happen. But if everybody just waits for a leader to say something who is not in fact planning on saying something or doesn't know the right thing to say, then things won't move. So, I mean, certainly what we used to see in a lot of emerging markets was a more local and distributed solution. Um, and then, it, especially because there can sort of be a lack of funding and a lot of bureaucracy at sort of central levels that allows them to sort of pick up something that's already working and champion it and say, hey, this is already successful, let's build on this instead of sort of trying from the top down to push a solution because it will take too long and often will be the wrong solution. So I, I do tend to say sort of demand driven things, you know, and, I mean, even here in the US, one of the things that I'm working on has been open sourcing uh, clinical protocols. And actually any of your colleagues in Brazil and friends in Brazil can look at the one that we posted. Um, but this was something where sort of, I, I, I approached both ends of the funnel. I went to some very senior people and said, we're gonna need um, some protocols that everyone can look at because hospitals don't have enough time to read the research and figure out what they need to be doing. Um, and they sort of were like, um, hum, 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 let's try and get everyone to agree. And they wrote some very, very vague and broad protocols. At the same time on Facebook, uh, tens of thousands of clinicians were saying, do you guys have protocols? And so I got, I worked with basically one person who had spent a lot of time uh, writing Ebola protocols in developing countries and she's at the Brigham to lay out very, very detailed protocols that anyone could pick up. Um, and now we have almost 200,000 people looking at them. So I would say, um, I would say like you try both and you see which one gets traction. And a lot of times the people who actually need the solution do the best job of generating the solution. And then other people can just amplify it once it's already rolled out. Um, Thanks so much, Mina. Je Jennifer, in a slightly different um, perspective on that same question, do you have thoughts on the talent that's required at really different levels of government and really how to figure that out. Because sometimes I know it can be quite difficult to find talent at different levels. Yeah, I mean, I think what's been really interesting, right, in, in a time of crisis, um, there's clearly a, a, a critical need that's highlighted. Um, but I, I would say that we need folks who understand uh, uh, how to implement digital solutions and how to dive deeply into understanding digital problems uh, at the highest levels, right? So, you know, of, of government all the way down to people who are actually implementing. Uh, that's a broad comment, right? Like that's a broad and vague comment. A lot of what we did at the United States Digital Service, as you know, and as Nina knows, um, was, uh, was basically trying, was basically crisis management for a given agency or for a given community at one point in time, as opposed to this, which is a much broader solution. Um, so I would say when it comes to, when it comes to now and when it comes to um, this type of pandemic, yes, we need people who understand um, and who are willing to uh, uh, work at all levels uh, in order to be able to help bring digital solutions and understand digital problems. But um, what I would say is the most important thing is that those folks at all levels actually um, who are helping actually care deeply about uh, what is needed right now. And I'm going to be specific about that. During a crisis, um, digital solutions are going to look different than when you have years to plan. <laughs> Right. So during a crisis is the time, and I say this especially for people who are on the line who are going to be interested in volunteering during a crisis, you need to find out what the government's need and what that demand is and you go in and you help at the level that they can that they can handle it. Um, and you work with them and help solve problems and build trust and move forward during a um, during kind of a, 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 when you have a longer opportunity to be able to help uh, an agency or an organization or a state or a city. Um, you do the same thing, uh, but perhaps you might push a little bit more to institute some really interesting changes or whatever. But during a, a, a situation like this is not the time to bring in really great people who are going to make huge changes in everything. Uh, it's the time to bring in people who are, are here to help. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Well, jump over to, um, right before I jump over to Annie's question, and then Jason, you're next. 
if you cannot um, find the hand raise or if you can't chat for some reason, feel free to turn on your video and just wave at me and I'll, I'll, um, I'll come through and find, try and find you as well. Annie, do you wanna ask your question next? We can't hear you. I think she dialed in. Uh, if you press star six on your phone, it should unmute you. Oh, I'm unmuted now. Can you guys hear yes, me? We can hear you very clearly. Okay. Hooray! Okay. Yay. Okay. So my question was um, about the U.S. digital response. I clicked on that website, and I really appreciate everything that everybody's been doing with the COVID-19, but I'm particularly interested in coordinating a PPE coalition, and my, my question is specifically around um, basically what are we doing with the military? So I just got out a year ago, and I have some friends that are overseas in Europe right now with my old unit, and they've been asked to make their own masks, and I was just wondering, like, how the PPE coalition works and like how does that work as a separate arm of the government and if somebody could speak a little bit more on that I'd appreciate it. And y'all, Annie just left the military as a helicopter pilot and left out that part which I think is so oh. bad. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. If you want y'all to take a quick question on the, um, I don't actually don't know who would be best so I'll just leave you two. <laughs> Let's talk about that. how it should work and how it is working right now which are not closely related. No, let's talk about that, how it should work and how it is, and also why that's the case, though. I think many of the many of the folks here just don't know why the should doesn't make it over to that thing that's supposed to work. It, Mia, did you want to start you want to tag team on this? Um, I mean, the, the how it should work um, is probably that it should be more centrally coordinated. Um, in an <laughs> ideal world, um, to exactly your point, this is a scenario where not having the states competing with each other would be ideal, where a bunch of the specific powers of the federal government um, are established in order to really uh, helpfully, I mean, this is a global crisis, right? And so this, our ability to bid on global markets, to chase down supply chains, to work with other countries and improve um, our ability to import PPE and to move it around the globe um, is something that the federal government has good powers to do. However, in the current environment, our federal government has said we would prefer to defer that to the state specific organizations and the military on its own. Um, and so in that context, I will observe something that has happened and then Ryan will talk about specific initiatives. But basically what happened is a lot of grassroots initiatives sprung up in addition to a lot of states striking out and, and hospital systems, honestly, that I've talked to striking out on their own because they said exactly to, to my point earlier, we got to solve this problem for ourselves until somebody else comes and solves it for us. Um, but now we've seen sort of um, just like sort of bubbles, how they fuse over time if you shake it all. They've, they've started merging. And so there are some larger coalitions and we've actually called on a few large companies to help um, consolidate these initiatives. Um, so I'll let Ryan talk about some of those and, and some are private companies that I think will come out in the next week or so. Um, and probably I won't yeah. help them yet. It, it, it's one of those things where, you know, someone's got to take the uh, ownership responsibility of coordinating things, right? And at the federal level, that responsibility was clearly not taken. And so it got dropped to the states. And from the states, they were overwhelmed with it, um, with what uh, their needs and ability to coordinate these asks. And so then that trickles down to the communities. And I think what's happened is just a reaction and response to that if you rewind back two and a half, almost three weeks ago, you have PPE coalition groups like Project N95, Find the Masks. Um, uh, uh, th there's like a frontline support group, like there's a handful, Operation Mask as well too. Like as you can see, there's so many names of different groups that have come about and what they're all trying to do is connect suppliers with demand and each of these groups have a unique skill or like capabilities, I would say some of them are tied deeper with logistics, some are tied with manufacturing, some have government experience. Um, and so what you are seeing is this is a full out scramble by as many people in as many places to source, find and uh, vet and deliver masks. And unfortunately it is causing some of the symptoms we're seeing on the other side, which is prices of masks are going up uh, uh, competition for masks means some suppliers don't have the needs that they need to get. 
communities are re relying on donations and people to make their own. You're then ultimately seeing CDC guidance that has said for the longest time that masks don't help and, you know, us as normal people shouldn't be wearing them. And that changing now with the, the reality that you can't find a mask anywhere, so just make one with your, you know, the, the cotton you have. Um, with all that said, I think what I'm hoping happens in these next couple of weeks forward is that all these groups that have been started up, they know what their strengths are, and they do that thing that Mina was talking about earlier, which is they start to consolidate, right? And these efforts start to consolidate around the ones, because uh, uh, for a lot of these folks, they're volunteer efforts, right? I mean, the consolidation is natural, and so for PPEs, we're going to see that happen. I'm also hoping, and you can see this in the language that FEMA has been using, is that they may take up the baton of being the central place for this, and they are doing it in small ways, like saying they'll vet suppliers, but they also need to do it on the demand side. Um, you see this as kind of like an interesting moment as well too for companies to step up. And, you know, you've seen everyone from Apple to I think a local company in the Boston area, New Balance saying, we're gonna make these things for our communities. And it's unfortunate that this problem could be so much better solved if someone just said, I task the Air Force, I task the United States Postal Service, I task Amazon with receiving every mask that gets made, we set a price and we're just gonna coordinate where they go. But unfortunately, we're not there at this current moment. Um, Thanks, you know, anything else to add there? Because I think you had I mean, some Just to double down on that, as everyone on this call, I think that Ryan and I are sort of agreeing and I'm open to any other thoughts that the more we can consolidate this initiative, at least among groups that are willing to sort of play by the optimal allocation as opposed to a hoarding mentality. I think the more that those groups can then be connected with the couple, what I'll call like probably likely coalitions to rule them all so that we can help speed the consolidation. I think that's actually a very useful thing for folks to do um, because otherwise, we just, we just, the more that we can do to accelerate that consolidation, I think will be productive. Annie, does that answer your question, especially as it relates to the military as well? Uh, yes, it does. And the other, I mean, I guess the only follow up I would have for that is just like when we could consolidate, would it make sense to go through the USDR for that? Like, would, like, I have people that are actually looking for masks presently and like, and like, that are deployed and like, where, where would the consolidation take place, I guess, would be the only follow up question I had, if that's um, a decent question. Why don't, so what I would propose is if you send, um, we can have an offline conversation, but I think that there are a couple leading points of consolidation that we should just connect them with. Um, yeah. So to whatever extent can be rolled up in the DOD and you guys have sort of a higher level point of contact or, you know, not 14 different bases, but to the extent that there's something like that, I think we should just connect them to some of the centralized responses that we're aware of. Awesome. Thank you. And I think a piece to toss in there as well, too, you know, from, from USDR, right, the U.S. Digital Response, our consolidation has been consolidating around you know, rallying that group of volunteers and being able to place them with projects. I mean, you know, even the formation of USDR is an example of co uh, taking disparate efforts and, and, and actually just bringing them together because it's, uh, it's the teams of people that get things done, not just individuals on their own. And for us, it was Corey, Raylene, and Jen, both Jen, Dennis Stasoff, and Polka, and myself all getting separate asks from federal, state, and local governments, and then us emailing at the same exact time within 24 to 48 hours, the same mailing list, and then within 24 hours saying, hey, shouldn't we just all do this together? And then 24 hours later, you have something called the U.S. Digital Response, and there you have a place to channel volunteers and effort, and it's just like, let's just scale, I think, the original desire and need. And, and in the PPE community, that same thing has been happening. Thank you. I think you have both, you just hit on another theme that's like this in the realm of simple but high impact, which is being the position to just bring all these pieces together without even making your own thing. You just, your, your thing is to bring everyone together. Thank you for sharing that. Jason, you're next. And then um, Anaya, you are queued up after Jason. Hi, can you, can you hear me all right? Yes, crystal clear. Yeah, so I have a quite a quick question and then one that's a little bit more involved. Uh, for some of the people who are on this uh, part of this conversation who are students or a little bit uh, just uh, who are who have 
only spend a little bit of time outside of school, uh, what is exactly are the best ways to actually keep up to date uh, and stay to stay up to date when these crises do emerge? Uh, if they have technical backgrounds, uh, how can we actually uh, stay up to date with some of the opportunities that do arise when these crises strike so that we can contribute um, as, as early as possible when the efforts are most needed? And in addition, uh, the more involved question that I have is um, when it comes time to, uh, for these crises and you have to, you wanted to be delivering things as quickly as possible, what exactly is, uh, how, how exactly do some of you with uh, more experience with dealing with previous crises uh, see the trade off between uh, shipping things quickly and also having the necessary security measures, whether it be um, like internet security or um, you know, uh, preventing uh, adversarial attacks on some of the systems that you actually create. Great. Thanks, Jason. For the first one, maybe um, Jennifer and Cord, you want to start with your people background and digital collaborative type world, um, and then we can see who else might want to chime in. Jennifer, you want to kick that one off? Sure. Yeah, the child just woke up. Sorry. So I was looking over in the corner. Um, <laughs> the, I mean, so in terms of the the brief question i don't know that it's a brief question honestly right because right you you would ask what's the key way uh to keep a uh, folk to to stay up to date and i would say i don't know aside from going to uh, your alumni group um or going to right your alumni group at your college or going to a place like the beck center who's going to be plugged in um and just making sure to stay on their lists and engaged with them um there's, there's not, um, there may be a place out there and I wouldn't be aware, but like there may be a place out there that keeps track, but it's not like USD, like the US digital response is going to be plugged in there, right, necessarily. And so what I would say is, um, maybe that's something you should work on. Um, and then uh, the second thing I would say, and you have all the people from your school there. Um, so I would say that's number one. Um, and then, uh, and sorry, I was distracted. The second question was. I think for the first one, we'll have Corey also okay. add. And then maybe, I don't know if Raleen has perspectives on like coming from the private sector and how she found it. Um, but I'll interject. There, there are folks who are now in more like the public interest tech movement that have created um, lists here and there. Tech Congress, Congress actually has a really comprehensive list that goes beyond just tech congress where you can follow a bunch of different job boards and email lists that they so there are a bunch of lists they're not necessarily consolidated and we can maybe share some of that out with this group as well um corey do you want to add yeah so that speaks directly to kind of that same networked approach the time to network and get yourself into networks and build networks as always and um showing up to the local code for boston brigade meetups get you um sort of familiarized and potentially even active on projects in your own community in ordinary times. So that when a crisis strikes, um, you already have that network of doers who you know are gonna be ready to jump in and get to work. And I'm, I'm sure they already are, um, that Code for Boston chapter is always very active. Um, but thinking about like, what can you do in your own community? So you don't necessarily have to be tapped into these fancy networks of um, you know alumni groups and other things which are great but um, you know you are living and working and surviving in a community wherever you are whether it's Cambridge or California or somewhere in between and are your community's websites up and running do they need support like what skills do you have that you could potentially offer to someone in your in your own backyard, in your neighborhood, whether it's the government or a non-governmental organization that's working to help neighbors really give the example of making sure neighbors who can't get out of their homes can run errands and get groceries and just make sure they're being taken care of. Like those are things regular people can do. You don't have to be part of some sort of grand networked endeavor. Um, or if you'd like to be, then start it, right? If it doesn't exist. Awesome, thanks Corey. Really, is there anything you wanna to add to that? We can move on to this. Oh, I guess just the one thing is, I think I remember hearing a lot of this advice when I was when I hadn't worked on any of this, and I just found it really hard to. It's like when you don't know the people, you don't know the people. And I guess one thing I've learned is it is a small world. Um, I think like everybody is like one degree removed, like even even in some ways smaller than like the tech the tech world where I come from, right? So I think if you are really interested, and I think start with finding someone that you either know or someone knows that works in government, and I think you'll quickly find your way into kind of these different groups and forums that people have mentioned. And follow the Code for America blogs and writings. It's a really great convener of this kind of work. 
as well. And some of the folks here have been quite involved with various initiatives at Code for America too. Can you repeat your second question one more time, Jason? Yeah, my second question was touching upon like when these crises do strike and you want to actually release uh, some sort of like new technologies to actually help address some of these crises. Um, I understand that there's there can sometimes be this trade off between uh, launching things and trying to put things out there to actually help and also some security issues that uh, where where you might release something with potential flaws that may potentially compromise your system or uh, devalue or depreciate uh, the brand that you actually have uh, for your product itself. And for some of you folks who have dealt with some of these crises in the past, how exactly do you see this trade off and what uh, how exactly do you balance those two competing interests? A great question about uh, shipping and building new things during times of crisis. Who wants to take that? I know you all have opinions. <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> Uh, I'm actually going to build on your question a little bit, Jason, because I think even more than security, it's like when you build something that's trying to help in a crisis, um, are you and are your team that's building it going to be around to keep sustaining it first, right? Even before the security piece of it, right? Like it's very easy to spin up really quick apps and widgets and things that could help, but what becomes really helpful is if people start using them. And then once they start using them, you know, you've got to find ways to maintain them and keep them alive. And I think that's something to think about. And um, that doesn't mean to not try and experiment and start. It means that just think about how over the next course of a couple of weeks, this thing truly sustains itself. Uh, a great example of that coming together was the group behind covidtracking.com, right? This is the place where you see uh, for the U.S. the most up-to-date test case data started by two random people, Alexis Mandrigal and Jeff Hammerbacher, uh, doing separate efforts that came together that then have a volunteer effort behind it. And they now know that they are truly responsible for this thing. On the, on the security side of the, um, the, the puzzle, you know, the closer you are working with government, like inside helping them manage sensitive data and things like that, you have to take that world really seriously. And I don't think they're gonna let a volunteer group in the door without those kinds of checkoffs and things like that. Like some of our groups within the USDR have to sign NDAs and other things that like uh, ensure that if sensitive info is being uh, shared, that it is protected. But then there's also this whole world of things on the outside that can be done that don't have the same level of, you know, security concerns, right? Because you're doing it more of in this open data, transparent fashion, like that covidprotocols.org example that Mina shared, right? Like that stuff there, you know, it's, it's meant to be public, it's meant to be shared um, versus perhaps a system that's maybe meant to track patient symptoms or something more sensitive. We gotta take those concerns and considerations at hand. Thanks, Ryan. Anyone else wanna chime in on that as well? Maybe other people who've built products in government and not? And you can't tell I'm trying to make eye contact with your lean or Mina. Oh, uh, yeah. No, I'm happy to, yeah. I, I was, I'm newer to the government side. Um, but I guess one thing, I basically echo everything Ryan said. I think the other thing that's interesting uh, to think about is like, which is, I think, more of a luxury from private sector is iteration and like components, right? So kind of playing off what Ryan said, I think some of, some of what I'm learning too is sometimes you don't know when you set out to do something, when it's crisis response, you may not you, you may just not envision what the second, third order effects are. And so being very careful about like checking in as you go, iterating on the model and even maybe shutting down services that provided a really important need in like week one, but in week three, you realize has downsides. I think that's a big part of it too. You have to kind of always be looking at what's the impact of the work um, and is it adding value? And if not, don't be married to it and just kind of shut it down. Um, and totally agree. There's so many components to things that are valuable. Like they're completely independent tools based purely on public data that have been hugely helpful. And then there are ones that are kind of behind the scenes that are harder to build, but then, you know, then you have different considerations for those. Thanks for Elaine. And one thing I'll add just because I've been thinking about this as well is, especially if you're outside of government and, or even if you're in government, and you're building something for, let's say a group of doctors. When people are in crisis response mode, the amount of energy to even learn anything new is not really there. And arguably it's not there even without crisis response, but be aware of any tech solutions we throw at people to like solve some problem when um, they may not be even able to actually use it because there's just no time to learn something, necessarily something totally, totally new. Um, One thing to add to that, just real quick, is that it is though the time that 
you can build trust with those people on the ground by helping them in the way that they need to be helped right then. Um, mm -hmm. And then in the future, be able to do a little bit more. Thank you. And Naya and then Sahar, you're after that. Hi, uh, thank you all for your comments. Um, sort of building on that discussion that Ryan and uh, Mina were having on centralization versus coordination versus decentralization. Um, what I'm, I'm wondering if you could provide an illustration of what the USDS should be developing for the federal government at a centralized level and what should be left to be done by private actors or other actors. I'm not sure who, it sounds like Mina would be great to answer that. Uh, is this specific to PPE? Yeah, I mean, you mentioned PPE, you mentioned like filing for unemployment benefits. Um, I guess any example. Um, to a certain extent, I think things can only be built for people who want them. And so, um, there are certain scenarios where um, the federal government will have a strong point of view, will get its act together and choose that it wants to enable a certain function. And there will be other times that they will defer it to entities outside the federal government. For example, if you even just look at the CARES Act, if we want to say there are an array of programs for small business relief, right? And so there's one program, the 7A program, the pay payroll protection program um, and administration of that program was delegated to private banks. There's another program which is emergency um, loans that is still being managed by the SBA, the Small Business Administration. And so there's some diversity in approaches there. Um, some of it is pushed up to the private sector and some of it is administered um, by the core federal government. And I think you'll see sort of that um, there are many different approaches. Sometimes they will specifically delegate it to the states. Sometimes they will not specifically, but choose not to pick it up. So it's certainly not the case that it, it's very hard. You can't build something for the federal government if the federal government doesn't want you to. There, it won't get used, right? So it's really, this is like sort of all product um, projects, which is make sure that your customer wants what you're building before you build it for them. Um, and that is both based on what they say and by their behavior. So, um, so it is really critical to sort of suss that out if you're going to undertake any project. Um, so having a sufficient level of engagement with your customer. And I think this is a little bit, you know, um, Raylene mentioned this, Corey mentioned this. I think it's very helpful to have at least someone on the team who has experience using, experience working with the government as the customer to be able to accurately interpret a bunch of um, signals that are not necessarily intuitive to people who are used to building consumer products, for example, um, to figure out wh what's really gonna happen um, when, when the product shows up. Um, Anyone else wanna add to that? Almost when I heard that question, it's like, like I also got, got a thought like, well, what, what do I wish USDS was being called and pulled into, right? And so USDS not being USDR, right? USDS, the team that's at the White House and, and really is for all those things that Mina talked about, right? It's like SBA, you need help pull in the digital service team. But that point she made is so important. You have to want and have to ask for the help in a lot of ways, especially for like these projects to be truly, truly successful. But, you know, there are so many uh, tech ish related problems that are like uh, the, uh, an old colleague um, of ours uh, uh, who passed away, Jake Brewer, would always say that, you know, tech isn't just a piece of the pie, it's the pan, right? It's a, a small portion of it, but it does hold together our policies and our programs. And so all the things and places we want our government to do action and take action on, um, tech likely plays a component. And so the more that they involve USDS as as partners, the more successful I think we'll be at getting to a good outcome. Great, thanks Ryan. Any one else on that, thoughts on, on that question? I'll punt it over to Sahar. Sahar, thanks. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for this. Um, it's evident that you're trying to tackle some pretty urgent matters um, that government and affected communities are facing. I was just curious how you think ahead about sort of like some of the second and third order effects of this pandemic. 
like are there are there projects that are in the pipeline that are sort of like sort of like the in ideation stage and you know sort of one one example is sort of like the very i mean we don't lots of things that are uncertain today but sort of the impact on the workforce and sort of income inequalities and all the sort of economic and um, employment related kind of issues that the government's going to be facing, you know, hopefully once the vaccine is, um, is, is, is invented. Um, so I was just curious how you think about not just like building frameworks and projects to meet like actual needs right now, but also thinking ahead more long term. And so I forgot to ask the others, is that where are you, where are you physically located? Where are you calling in from? Uh, I'm calling from Dubai. It's uh, 10 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us. That was a little bit of a leading question because I kind of knew that. Um, <laughs> who wants can to jump on this uh, to start us off, Kathy? So um, that's a great question, Sahar. And I think we are all wired to think about the not just the today or the tomorrow or next week, but the long, long term in the way that we work, especially most of us having spent a lot of time in government. Governments work very far out. And so if we wanna think about how to solve, not just for today, but for the long term, we can make use of the situation we are in, um, as some like to say, never let a crisis go to waste, and solve for the urgent needs to make sure that people who need, um, again, food stamps or small business loans or unemployment benefits or some of these things that are critical systems day in and day out and are especially critical in this moment when you're experiencing, as Jennifer said, the, you know, the worst days of your life right now, um, we can work to solve for meeting those needs right now and to setting up the, the infrastructure that we really should have had all along perhaps so that these systems can work better in the future. And knowing the strain that we're in in this moment allows us to make the case for the better, the additional resourcing and the longer term vision with our colleagues who may not have um, been in a position to prioritize some of these efforts before. Thanks, Corey. Any other thoughts on second, third order issues, effects on economy, inequality, et cetera? Um, yeah, this is Jennifer. So I, I think it's, to Corey's point, so where I've been focused has been on, uh, with many of the folks who are on this call, uh, in terms of thinking about, you know, six months from now, 12 months from now, 18 months from now, how do we ensure that we have people who are in critical leadership positions who understand technology um, and who understand, I guess, the PAN uh, and the role that the PAN plays so that folks who understand technology can come to the table because in many of the cases and a lot of the things that, uh, a lot of the, the ways that Corey had mentioned when you talk about food stamps, when you talk about healthcare, when you talk about unemployment benefits, when you talk about all of these things, the policies are often made uh, uh, exclusive of uh, any input from folks who understand both the constraints and the opportunities inherent in the existing technical systems. Um, and both of those are a problem, right? Because it's sort of, you, you, we're no longer in a stage when it comes to the scale at which our federal government is, where people can sort of come up with policies and toss it over uh, to some nameless faceless people who will just make it happen. That's actually what's led to a lot of challenges that folks are facing right now. And when we look at the current situation where the systems are, are, are busting and breaking and causing very human issues, such as, you know, if you read the New York Times this weekend, someone having to look for a fax machine in the middle of a, um, in the middle of uh, a pandemic in order to be able to get their unemployment insurance, that, that kind of stuff, uh, stuff that has been an issue for a long time, but uh, to Corey's point, it's now top of mind for folks in a much uh, a larger way than it used to be. And we have to focus and invest in getting uh, the people in who can help make decisions at the right times and to understand that there are many more leadership folks. It's very difficult to look beyond right now. It just very, it is very difficult to look beyond right now for those folks who are, um, who are in process and who are trying to respond. Uh, I would actually say for the folks on this call and others, to the extent that anyone can start thinking three months in advance and getting folks together mm -hmm. to think three months in advance, we'll all be in a better place, um, even if it's just for a moment, uh, so that we can start planning ahead. Some of us are thinking further, but three months is probably gonna be a good place to start working. Thanks, Jennifer. Anyone else wanna chime in on that question? 
for um, for folks who haven't been able to raise their hand or put anything into chat, I want to just give leave this time to um, just unmute yourself and ask a question. Since I know sometimes raising your hand or putting stuff in chat just might not be that simple. I'll give folks a few seconds. If I just want to take yourself off of mute and just go ahead and ask your question. We had a dying question. Anyone? I saw someone, Puneet, I saw you unmute. Anyone else? I'm scrolling through all the screens. Okay, um, we have about 15 minutes before I ask the official end, so I think I'll leave with two things. I'm gonna ask a, um, I'm gonna ask a question, a more serious question to everyone. And then let's wrap up with, um, once all this is over, what's the one thing you want, what's the first thing you'll do first that you can't do right now? But before we get to that, <laughs> um, what, of, of, you've talked about so many different things, both things that are immediate to COVID now, and is also this movement as a whole with, with tech and civic tech and government. Um, what is something that is just, that feels really big right now that you're just thinking about where we just don't really know the solution yet, but you're hoping that we can think through in the next upcoming months. What is something that you that that's still a big problem or issue space that kind of keeps you up at night, or just that that you're really really concentrated or focused on, or really thinking about um, that we don't really have a solution to yet necessarily, but you just want to throw it out there as a thing that um, even with all the brilliant minds that we have around us, is still just a really difficult thing that we don't know um, which direction to take yet. I'll give you a few to think about that and that's kind of a big question that I hadn't really prepared anyone for but what is something you know especially since we have so many other people here they can think about it as well something that feels kind of really big or a problem space that you're just thinking about right now I can jump Sorry. in while others are thinking so this came up a little bit through different threads we've been pulling at in this conversation and you know one of the things that always feels true in a moment when we're all trying to solve something as a community together, but even when we're off doing our own things is um, we sometimes forget that someone somewhere has probably solved whatever problem we have before. There's probably some solution out there. Um, we may not know who they are. We may have never heard of the solution. We may not know how to find them or even where to look, but it's probably there. And the smartest thing we can do when we're in a moment of crisis or any other time is to step back and think about who those other solvers and doers might be and to find them and work with them. It is so much, we can work and move so much faster and smarter and stronger together than we can on our own. And lifting up others who've been working in a space much longer than we have is going to get us there much faster. I think sometimes we forget that and sometimes our community of technologists forgets that because we are really excited about this thing we can build and ship and provide to the world. Um, and I'm using a we here when I maybe shouldn't because I come at this work as a policymaker and a lawyer and so not as an engineer or some others who might actually be doing more of that traditional build. But, um, but taking that step back and ensuring that we're really doing a scan to find people who aren't being seen and recognized for the work they've been doing, which can often be um, individuals from communities that are overlooked who've been um, underestimated and marginalized or otherwise under-resourced over time, like finding those voices and those solvers and those doers and partnering with them, supporting them, lifting them up, or just getting out of the way and moving on to a different problem because there's plenty of work to do. Um, but that's something I've been thinking about a lot. How can we use this as a learning moment to remember that whatever problem we're trying to solve, someone's probably solved it before. Oh, thank you so much, Corey. I'm just going to go down the list um, so that we had earlier. Raylene, do you have um, some thoughts? Yeah. Um, wait, one part was supposed to be fun, right? What we're going to do after. Yes, we'll do the fun part later. This later, is okay. the, uh, the big <laughs> thing the that, okay. that you're still um, thinking about every day. Yeah, so something I've been thinking about, I, I think it's like in the back of my mind, is it's very abstract, but like, Things are going to be very different after all of this. Um, you know, people who are out of jobs, people who didn't find new jobs, and I've been thinking a lot about um, uh, what does the new wave of recovery look like. Um, just to, as a personal note, I spent a lot of time working and thinking about climate change before all this happened. So part of me has been thinking like, what does it look like after this? Do we kind of invest in a more green economy? 
um, and is this kind of a reset to, to think about renewable resources and, and green energy and like all the jobs that are needed to get at change. So that's a very, very, very optimistic view that I, it's more like it's a dream, but um, it obviously it comes on the back of a lot of hardship too. So that's what I think about. Thanks, Raylene. Um, yeah, I do ahead. enjoy how she like emerges from the mist around the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, yeah, I mean, I work um, and spend most of my time in healthcare. And so this has very, um, this crisis in the immediate term has a lot of major implications and is sort of changing a lot of perspectives across healthcare. But I think um, the thing I want to allocate all my extra cycles to is, okay, what does this mean for healthcare longer term in the United States, which was already what I was working on, but this is a very different shock to the system that will um, open up some new opportunities, also get rid of some opportunities, you know, right before this, I was going to make a TV series comparing healthcare in a bunch of different countries from the perspective of a user. Um, and obviously the desire to travel to a bunch of different countries and observe their healthcare system is, it, it would look completely different, right? You couldn't do that right now. So some, some conversations are going to be different. On the other hand, this really is changing um, the stodginess and staidness of certain aspects of healthcare. Every major academic medical system right now is setting up ICU beds in operating theaters and trying to figure out, just like everybody else is trying to figure out how to convert their capacity, how to change things quickly. They're not going through all of their uh, multi-year review processes to figure out what protocol is the most effective. And so there are just a ton of things across the board that are being upended. And whenever you shake the boggle ball, then the question is how much can you influence where the pieces fall back down afterward, right? When everything has been disrupted. And so um, I spend my time and with a few other colleagues really thinking about, okay, so what are the things about this that we want to influence how it settles longer term? Um, not to be opportunistic, but really just to make sure that we continue moving forward as a country in a healthcare system that I think a lot of people were already somewhat dissatisfied with. This just creates an opportunity for some transformation that might be needed. Um, Thanks so much, Nina. And Ryan? Uh, I, I took that question as being like, what's the thing that keeps me up at night or the thing that I keep worrying about? And, and it's like, um, uh, for all the effort and energy that we're spending, are we just fixing the symptoms of a true root source problem cause? Well, one of the things that uh, Mina and I would spend a lot of time with during the healthcare.gov days would be listening to um, like bug reports and issues that people had and, you know, downstream you hear them, but the real root causes are something broken up here that's causing all of this stuff that's um, taking place uh, downstream. In the case for COVID, it's like, you know, we have to and can and need to do everything we can to support our frontline healthcare workers, doctors, and PPEs and, and ventilators. But when someone's at a ventilator, it means we failed something upstream. And so what are the things we can do upstream to reduce the spread of the coronavirus? Like, how can we encourage and make sure people know that they need to stay at home? And by the way, most of these interventions aren't you know, technological or clinical, they're, you know, human behavior. And that's something that I think everybody in this group and on this call, we, we can influence, right? How do we encourage people to stay home? How do we encourage people to wear masks? How do we really change our behaviors? Because I would say that for most of us on this call, we are in places or in communities where we're like, no, duh, that's the thing we have to do. But we still have a portion of our country that has heard something else different and are catching up. And unfortunately, because this is an exponential crisis and problem every day wasted means we need more PPEs and ventilators and so forth. And so I just keep thinking, how, how can we work on problems upstream to truly so, slow the spread? Because as not a doctor myself, those feel like areas that I can probably try to try to help with. Thank you so much, Brian. And I come from a family of service workers and similar to Raylene, I, I think a lot about um, what things are gonna look like after this and um, what the, some of the fallout will be as well. Um, so I think to end, uh, and I'll, I'll thank everyone in a minute, um, but to end, let's wrap up with what is the thing that you can't do right now, but are really looking forward to doing the moment all of this is behind us um, and we're in a different kind of new world, whatever that looks like. Um, Corey, would you like to kick us off? 
Sure. So I didn't say much about the Beck Center for Social Impact at, and Innovation at Georgetown, but we're this um, uh, experiential learning center on campus that draws students from all of the different academic colleges. Um, so we have data scientists and uh, policymakers and uh, folks who are, have backgrounds in law and just all of the things um, working together in one space. And um, like all of you, you know, we're all back dispersed where we live and unable to get together and kind of missing that um, cross collaborative uh, workspace that we're all used to, but making the best of it. So um, once we're through this and we're all able to get back on our campuses, um, I will really look forward to bringing together uh, this nice cross pollinated group of, of folks who've been pitching in on this work and of the students who are dropping everything to find ways to be helpful and useful and back home in their communities where they've come from and um, learning from each other as we um, you know, get back into the swing of things on campus again someday. Thanks, Corey. Yeah. And celebrating graduation. Um, right. We'll have to do it sometime. Thank you. Raylene, what are you looking forward to most? Um, I, I didn't appreciate how much I liked being outside and just like <laughs> walking around and in, in, or, in or out of crowds, but just like enjoying outdoors and camping and all that stuff. So. I'm really looking forward to doing that again. Me too. Jennifer? Uh, I would like to go to Hawaii and work remotely. <laughs> also. <laughs> um, but, but looking forward to getting on a plane and meeting with all the uh, awesome people that um, we need to get together with over the next however many months it is afterwards to really work on recovery. Um, so uh, I'm excited about that, but in between Hawaii. Thanks, Jennifer. Mina? Um, yeah, I would agree. I think travel. I mean, uh, and I encourage you, Raylene, to go outside. I was going to say, the, the respite has been, if you get into the woods, there is really much less risk of COVID. Um, <laughs> so a bunch of hiking, but, but definitely miss travel to go see family and friends in new places. Yeah. Ryan? Uh, it, it makes you very, very, this, this whole crisis has made you just really treasure and value all like the simple things, right? Like going to a restaurant, just being able to walk outside. I think the thing that I miss a lot is just like play groups for Ansel. Uh, you know, he was on this call before it went live, but it's like, you know, he's just kind of solo right now. And so I, I can't wait for a little play group to happen again and not have to worry <laughs> that they will be spreading things between them and then to us. But um, yeah. Playgroups and time with uh, family because they haven't seen him either in a while too. Yeah. Yeah. Minus FaceTime. So, but the silver lining in this is also weird. I don't think we've ever spent as much time with our family than we have now on FaceTime. So, like it's it's anyway. Yeah, and or just time with our families in general, right? I I feel like I see my kids usually three hours a day, and now I see them a lot more. <laughs> Um, thank you all so, so, so much for taking time out of your day. Corey, thank you for partnering with this, with the Beck Center, um, and just sharing so much of your deep experience across your lifetime, um, across the many crises you've been a part of, across design and product and engineering and government and private sector, um, and, and to shed some light on some of the work that's going on right now with tech and um, COVID and, and crisis response. So thank you so much and thank you to everyone for, for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and pause the, stop the recording now. Um,